I'm Brian Delp. I'm the host of Drive Time on WBGO, and it is my great honor and pleasure to welcome the incredible arranger and composer extraordinaire, Vince Mendoza, to the WBGO studios. Vince, yeah. thank welcome. you, Brian. It's great to have you with us today. Oh, it's it's great to be with you, and thank you for the invitation to be on WBGO. Well, Love first of all, with well, we we are the station for the jazz capital of the world, and right. and I I do know that you have lived in Los Angeles for quite a number of years, but that you also listen to us on a regular basis, and that really makes us all very happy. I I do, and I have to say that you know my my origins are are from right up the the road there in in Connecticut, and I spent quite a bit of time in New York, and and of course the, during the times that I made recordings in New York. Um, you know, I, I loved being there in the studios with the musicians and, and the jazz scene in New York is, is still, you know, the center of the world. Now I know that uh, the Grammy awards are coming up this weekend. And after che carefully checking the list, and I'm really glad I did. I noticed that you again have another nomination. How many nominations yeah. does this make for you? Um, I think it's something like 37, something like that. But That's I also lucky. notice, and I'm sure people will agree with me, that it, it must be a bittersweet nomination, considering that you're nominated for arranging Songbird it is, for the yeah. wonderful Christine McVie, who passed right. last November, just after your right. birthday, right? Right. And it was done uh, uh, quite a while ago, this track. I was asked by Glenn Johns to, uh, to work with him on this uh, reissue that they made of Christine's music and the the one track that they wanted to to re-record was an arrangement of Songbird using her original voice from the Rumors yes. album from 1978 uh, and so um, and, and for me to write around that that uh, track uh, with vocals and and we had a um, you know we were graced with her presence in the studio and um and uh, it was really wonderful to be able to to finally meet her and and um, you know express my appreciation for for you know so many years of beautiful music, and <laughs> particularly that song. Indeed, I mean the, the, you're talking about a voice that you and I both grew up with. We being of really a similar age. That's right. So you and but you have worked with so many incredible legends uh, as an arranger and composer for the last three four decades. Uh, the list is just wild Joni Mitchell and Elvis Costello and Ricky Lee Jones and too many to name actually how was it working with Christine Christine was beautiful I, I mean oh, I didn't really talk to her all of that much in the in the writing process Glenn pretty much set me loose on the on the track and um, you know I didn't see her until she came to the studio when we recorded it with the orchestra so we didn't have too much of a time to to spend together, but I think she was very <laughs> generous to let me do what I wanted to do with the track. And of course, I've been living with this song since 1978, right? I mean, the, the, as have we all. Yeah, Fleetwood Mac has been our friends since since then, and um, so uh, to be able to work on this song and and put my stamp on it was was a really great gift. Well, good luck on on Sunday. I know the competition is always very stiff, but uh, speaking of it which, uh, you actually have on your new album, Olympians, one of the people that's nominated for best jazz vocalist this year, and that's the the angelic Cecile McLaurin Salvat. That's right, angelic is right. I indeed, I do. We, my wife and I just spent time with her on board the Blue Note at Sea Cruise in the Caribbean a Ooh. couple of weeks ago. It was, and she's just outstanding. She's not only a great artist, but just a, a genuine, uh, warm and giving person. Absolutely, that you immediately recognized. So I'm, yeah. I'm sure you had this uh, similar um, uh, experience working. She's with a, her. a true amazing talent. And I've, I've worked with her um, a couple of times with the Metropole uh, and we've gotten to know each other and, and, and I've gotten to see how broad based her talent is, you know, besides the, the music or her visual art, the, uh, the needlepoint, the drawing and, mm. you know, everything that she does, everything she wears, everything uh, is centered toward her interest in, 
in art and uh, and creativity. So you know, to be able to to work on this particular piece that had lyrics written by Norma Winstone of a piece that I wrote several years ago. Uh, she loved Norma's work with John Taylor and Kenny Wheeler, and she wanted to jump in on the song. And uh, so, you know, her approach to it is is very special. And and I love the way that she really takes the the lyric and the song and the stories seriously. And you could tell by her her duet uh, work with Sullivan and and her recordings that the that the stories and, and the lyrics really mean a lot. And, and she brings you into a story in a very meaningful way. She's not the only great voice that is on your new album, Olympians. Also, you have someone who's run, who's actually probably won won more Grammys than you, Diane Reeves. Right. <laughs> and, the, yeah. and and she uh, is showcased in which selection? Diane is singing a uh, version of uh, this song of mine called Esperanto that uh, that appeared uh, as a instrumental many years ago and Kurt Elling wrote lyrics to it quite a while ago and recorded it on his live in Chicago recording and and um, subsequently has been recorded by a few artists and I, I really wanted to include this piece on on the record uh, because I felt that the the power of the orchestra combined with uh, Diane's uh, message that she gives us in everything that she sings. You know, we sit up and listen to what she's trying to tell us. She has a and voice you have to pay attention to. <laughs> she does. And, and um, so I, I was so lucky to be able to have her on this record. And, and um, I'm very grateful for the beautiful reading of, of the lyric that she, she gave. And uh, it's quite a powerful track and um, it's, it's out there now for people to hear if they want to hear it as Baranto. Well, it will be. That's the, uh, you know, my, I have to admit to you, I have not been able to download or listen to Olympians. So I'm kind of going into this interview, uh, not so much blind as deaf to <laughs> what you've been doing with the Metropole Orchestra. I mean, I've heard all of your previous material, all of which right. I really enjoy. You go back with the Metropole Orchestra, 28 years now? Right. Yeah, I started with the orchestra in uh, 1995. Of course, they started in 1945 okay. and it went through a, um, several uh, conductors and uh, visions and, and paths. And uh, I arrived there in 95 and uh, became the chief conductor in 2005 for nine seasons and we did a lot of recordings and, and uh, got them out on stage and started thinking about touring. And, and, you know, there really became this international name. Now everybody knows the Metropole Orchestra and we've had quite a few amazing guests over the years. Uh, and um, some of them are on this record. Not Al Jarreau, of course, because <laughs> well, no, <laughs> but a number uh, of years ago, but that is one of their greatest live recordings, I think. Yes, yeah, and uh, I, that was a really enjoyable record to make. Uh, Al was wonderful, and uh, we were able to to uh, to do renditions of some of his hits, and uh, we did quite a few shows with him during that time, and pretty much all of it. Oh, I have to say, all of the record is is live with the orchestra, which is a, another testament to, to how amazing they are on stage. You know, they, they really, you know, it's like fire hitting the stage whenever they play. I've been announcing selections from uh, the Metropole Orchestra, many of them conducted by you, but not necessarily all of them. But the one appellation I give to the Metropole Orchestra every time I put them on the air is the orchestra that can play absolutely anything. Right. At any time, anywhere. Right. They have that incredible versatility. And I'm sure that it serves your music well because you combine so many different influences into every single one of your compositions. Can you tell us how that comes about? Well, it took a while, <laughs> I have to say. <laughs> you know, um, going into the orchestra, you know, I had 
uh, many years of experience of, of, of listening and, and writing different styles and, and uh, trying to figure out how to get people to play them. And the orchestra has always been very open to the challenge and enthusiastic about learning new things. And, and uh, over the years, we've really gotten to the point that the orchestra is comfortable in playing in a lot of different languages. You know, they can play straight ahead music, but also they're, they're playing funk and working with rappers and uh, you know, Brazilian music. You know, we, we, we won the Latin Grammy many years ago for Yvonne Lenz, but you know, the best popular music recording played by a Dutch orchestra, you know, it's, <laughs> it's, it's wild. So they, they're really um, quite comfortable and versatile with, with so many different types of music. And it takes a minute, but it, it takes uh, the uh, understanding and patience and enthusiasm of an orchestra to really get into, you know, why particular music sounds the way it does and how can we get it uh, to be like that. And, and that, that's a, you know, a, a testament to, to their, uh, you know, broad-based enthusiasm and and skill well you also have besides uh, the presence of diane reeves and cecile mclaurin salvant a couple of terrific saxophone players from the states not that you don't have a fantastic saxophone player in the metropole orchestra who is uh, mark schulten i guess well mark schulten and paul van der Fein, leo jansen the, the, there are quite a few really great sax soloists in the orchestra, but we decided to, to invite a couple of other players from the States. Chris Potter plays on, on the arrangement of Barcelona and uh, David Binney, uh, formerly at New York uh, resident, moved back to LA and, you know, put together a scene there. And um, he, he had actually been playing a lot with my son, Luca, who's a, a, a keyboard player in LA and they've been working together. So we've, I've gotten to know Dave, over the years and um, so we we gave him a, an opportunity to to uh, to catch fire on the recording as well oh he he knows all about catching fire i've seen he david does. Benny play here oh, yeah. <laughs> i'm sure i'm sure he's lost none of that uh despite the mellow laid-back atmosphere of where you live now <laughs> right well we have we have the fire burning inside of us so. <laughs> i'm glad, I'm glad you mellow. brought it out there man <laughs> the same mean, we may seem mellow but we're not uh now with the metropole orchestra you're doing one particular thing but you're also noted for leading the wdr big band in cologne germany right. for a number of years how long have you been associated with the wdr uh, longer. You know, I started uh, with the WDR around 1990, 89, 90, but, but my music was being played before that with Joe Zavinol, uh, who invited me to to write some music for them. And, and then they invited me to uh, you know, join them in the studio. And um, we've done many recordings together in Cologne. And uh, we just finished one with Raul Midon in, in uh, December. So um, they're also a, a terrific band. They have a very particular sound and um, way what is of the, recording. What is the difference between working with the Metropole Orchestra and with the WDR Big Band? Besides the obvious, we, that. <laughs> uh, should I? Is that a question I shouldn't have asked? Well, look, you know, jazz is a very personal art form, you know, and jazz composers write from the perspective of the player. And, you know, uh, Ellington is a perfect example of that. Absolutely. And so when we're writing for particular people, you know, they realize their music in, in, a, in a very personal way. So uh, the WDR band has a, has a, a very uh, particular sound to them by virtue of the, the, the players. And uh, Metropole has, a, has another sound. Of course, they're an, an orchestra with strings and, and percussion and harp and orchestral woodwinds and all of that. So they, they have a, another type of a palette, but we are still talking about a personal experience of, of musicians, the people that contribute to our music. And uh, so that VDR has a, has their own particular sound to them, not to mention the studios, the people who record them, 
you know, there is a particular sound to those records. And uh, I think everybody notices that. Well, I, I, I really want to, if I could take you back I, 30, 40 years, did, at that time when you were, for instance, going to Ohio State University and then when you transferred out to USC, I guess, in, in, the, in Southern California, did you realize that this is what you wanted to do? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> you know, I, I, uh, I can remember that uh, I grew up listening to the radio and so I, I grew up with a lot of R and B and pop music, jazz on the radio, um, to the extent that they were playing jazz on AM radio in those days. AM, um, I, you know, That's for me, the, heard it. yeah, the the light went on um, with the Philadelphia soul uh, sound, uh, Tom Bell and and Gamble and Huff, and and using orchestra instruments with a rhythm section, French horns, Glockenspiel. You know, that was a, you know, of course we heard it with, with Burt's music on, on uh, pop radio, but then to hear these, you know, funky rhythm sections and horn sections playing with glockenspiel and timpani and, and all of that was, you know, that's when the light went on for me that, you know, I want to do that. And so to be able to, to be in the studio making records, you know, that was my vision, but I also loved movie music. And I had aspirations to go to L.A. to write uh, film music. But I got too busy working on records and traveling. And, and that part of the uh, thing never really happened. And uh, I, I'm, to, to be honest, I'm, I'm glad that things happened the way they were. I made a lot of beautiful friends and musical connections and a you know, shelf full of great memories. Well, as I pointed out earlier, you and I are very, of a very similar age, and I've been doing this a long time. And by the way, I have a great affinity for highly arranged selections. I've been airing them for 40 years. And hmm. to me, what you are to my particular generation is basically our, our Klaus Ogerman or our Don Sebesky or our Oliver Nelson, even though Oliver didn't last that long. Uh, they were all tremendous composers and arrangers who could actually be counted on to rise to whatever situation they were being put in. Right. And I think that this is what you're doing with not only your own albums, with the WDR, with the Metropole Orchest, with an all-star band, with the Czech Philharmonic, which I believe you utilized on your last project. Right. Uh, but you're doing it in just that similar fashion. That's really not a question. I just wanted to get that out there. <laughs> well, I appreciate that. Well, they're all amazing writers that you just mentioned. And Oliver, of course, was also writing a lot of uh, television and film music. Right up uh, until the day he died, actually. Right. Yeah. Not an easy, uh, not an easy job to have. Did you did so? You can you honestly tell me that you think you chose an easier road with what you're doing, as opposed to writing for the big and small screens? I think I did, uh, and uh, I don't want to cast aspersions on on uh, media composers, but I, I think they feel it too that that sometimes the amount of of pressure that mm. they feel to come up with something that is you know may or may not be their vision, but the vision of the of the director uh, is is sometimes a, a frustrating uh, feeling, and uh, you know the fact that that any composer can come up with <laughs> with a great piece of music that sits on its own um, is, is a miracle. And, you know, of course it happens all the time and we have a huge library of great film music to, to speak to that. But I, I think that working on recordings that um, I, you know, making connections with the musicians and with stories in a meaningful way that, that allow you to contribute a certain part of yourself as as unique to to this pursuit and so i, I feel uh, fortunate that that i've been able to do it all of these years um <laughs> i don't miss the pressure of, of writing for um you know television or film uh, but i do welcome the the, the camaraderie and the you know long friendships that i've uh, developed with the musicians that have played on these records and indeed, these we're talking about you know relationships now that go back decades. Yes. Yes, absolutely. 
Absolutely. All right, penultimate question because I don't I don't want to keep you that long. <laughs> <coughs> Excuse me. But uh when you're not sitting over score paper and writing music, I'm assuming that's the way you do it. <laughs> what would you rather be doing and where would you rather be doing it? I don't think that I have very many things that I would rather be doing other than music. Uh, you know, I have a lot of students, as you may know, a lot of composition students uh, at uh, the University of Southern California. So to the extent that I'm not writing music for my own projects, I'm, I'm um, you know, thinking about their visions and, and you know, projects and, and how they're doing it. But I, I can tell let you in on on not such a secret that that I am a ham radio enthusiast. So oh, being really? In front of a microphone on the radio is something that I've always wanted to do ever since I was a kid. <laughs> so uh, you I'm, know, I, I'm sorry. I'm i you know <laughs> you're you're talking to someone who does it every right. single day. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so I, whenever I step into a radio studio, I get really excited. That's great. And um, so we have the antenna over the house and the, the set is in the corner. And and uh, when I have a minute, I get on the air. And When's the last time you talked to New Zealand or Kazakhstan? Because I'm assuming, <laughs> you know, New Zealand you can is, talk to anyone. New Zealand is is, uh, is available to me with my present direction of the, the uh, Kazakhstan is a little far. But, you know, I need to get an amplifier. Got it. As some of my <laughs> Still, friends tell me that's but, uh, that's terrific. There's some yeah. see something we didn't know yes. about Vince Mendoza. Yeah, little Is little it? tidbit for you all in the radio. After audience. after the apocalypse, he's the guy you're going to be talking <laughs> to, right. not me. Come on over. I'll, I'll send some messages. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> that was just illustrated in this new HBO show, uh, The Last of Us. We saw this just the other night. Uh, the ham radio operator in Boston and a line of people down the hall waiting to send messages out. <laughs> well, when, when your iPhone stop working, yeah, uh, mm -hmm. my, my wire over the house is still in action. <laughs> I think that's, that's terrific. I almost want to end it there, but I, I've got to ask you my last question. It's a two parter. Okay. Uh, are you going to the Grammy awards this weekend? Considering yes, we are you going. are one of the nominees. We're, we're going, and I'm excited about the nomination, but I'm also excited about seeing so many of our friends yes. that are nominated this year. And, of course, the SEAL is going, and and uh, the WDR band has been nominated, uh, and the orchestra has been nominated for the Manhattan Transfer Project that I worked on. Uh, Steve Gadd and his you know friends with Micah Benny are, are nominated. Uh, John Beasley for his record. Uh, with um, the uh, SWR band, I think it is, uh, you know, Cecile, I think yes, I mentioned right. already. And, you know, there, there are quite a few of our friends that uh, I'm looking forward to seeing. And, you know, we very rarely get to see each other. Uh, well, it sounds like a party. Take advantage of. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> For once, I wish I was in Los Angeles this Well, we wish Sunday. you were here too. Well, fly on out, Brian. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> sure. Why not? My and here really is my absolute last question. Considering okay. the amount of Grammy awards that you have already, if you bring home another one on uh, Sunday night, who builds your shelves? Reinforcement. <laughs> we need reinforcement. Um, trip to Home Depot. <laughs> that's exactly. Yeah. I've got to build shelves this weekend myself, so you know that's where oh, I'm going. Okay. But I may need a <laughs> consultation. Right. right. <laughs> Vince, thank you as always for being with us. WBGO thank you for the thanks you and, and all of our listeners, thank you. Greetings for your to work, your listeners. For your work and for and for taking the time to be with us today. Good luck on Sunday. Thank you, Brian.